A reading from the first book of Samuel. There was a certain man of Ramathim Zophin of the hill country of Ephron, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zoth, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peniana. And Peniana had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophini and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peniana, his wife, and to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah said to her, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my lord. I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor stored drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you peti- grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I I have asked for him from the Lord. The man, Elkanah, and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best for you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull 
an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. The word of the Lord. Good morning, Emmanuel. This fall, we are meeting the God of the impossible in many different places. And this morning, we're going to look at one woman's encounter with the God of the impossible in the midst of deep suffering. Now, none of us seeks out suffering, but suffering tends to visit us unbidden. It's an unwelcome guest in our lives. And sometimes this guest does not leave for a very, very long time. Whether you are a person of faith or a person of no particular faith at all, suffering can disrupt our plans and disorient our souls. But for those who believe in the God of the impossible, suffering raises particularly poignant questions. Does God see us in our suffering? Will he remember us in our distress? And will he act to save us? The book of 1 Samuel opens with a description of a household in disarray. We meet Elkanah and his two wives, Hannah and Penina, and get a glimpse of their family dynamics. You may have noticed a red flag already. Many families in the ancient Near East featured more than one wife, and pretty much everywhere we encounter this situation in Scripture, things are going about as well as you might expect. Hannah is Elkanah's first wife, and she is a woman in deep pain because the Lord has closed her womb. She has been unable to bear any children. In contrast, Elkanah's second wife, Penina, has borne many children, and Penina makes it her business to remind Hannah of this regularly and cruelly. The language of this text is meant to emphasize that Hannah has been stuck in a very painful rut for a very long time. Year after year, year after year, year after year after year, Penina taunts Hannah about her infertility while she herself gives birth to many sons and daughters. This pattern has been in place for a long time, and nothing is changing. Now, by the end of this chapter, which we're able to read in the space of a few minutes, Hannah's suffering comes to a very happy resolution. And on the one hand, a real-life testimony of how the God of the impossible answered the prayers of a fellow believer, that can be super encouraging. On the other hand, anyone currently waiting for God to act in the midst of their own deep pain, success stories can be really troubling. The white-hot question for many people of faith is not, can the God of the impossible answer prayer, but will God meet me in my suffering, and will he answer this particular prayer of mine that I'm asking right now? I know that God is with me and will ultimately save me, but will he make his power known by rescuing me from these particular circumstances? And I don't know the answer to that question. And I don't think this text will resolve that question in the next 20 minutes. But I have great confidence in the Lord's ability to use his word to confer his grace to us even in the midst of painful, unanswered questions. And that's my hope for us this morning. Hannah's example merits our attention for a multitude of reasons. 
She's a very ordinary woman. And her difficulties, however devastating they may be for her, are from one perspective, only small scale domestic lady problems. In the books of First and Second Samuel, full of stories about prophets and priests and kings, it looks like she can only play a very minor role. And in the eyes of the world, Hannah doesn't really do anything other than to pray. The only action she takes is prayer. And yet, the church has always recognized Hannah as an extraordinary exemplar of faith, a saint of unusual grit and grace. Hannah directed her requests to the God of the impossible, and I'm really grateful that we have her story to dive into this morning. Is prayer easy or difficult? When you're in a period of prolonged suffering, does prayer get simpler or does it get more complicated? I think there's arguments both sides. But Hannah faced three challenges that have the potential to make prayer harder. Listen to these words from Scripture describing Hannah's life. Weeping. Heart sick. Unable to eat. Deeply distressed. Weeping bitterly. Troubled in spirit. Pouring out her soul. Great anxiety and vexation. Sorrow of this intensity often brings additional difficulties with it. Sometimes, fear of our own unworthiness discourages us from directing our prayers to God. For some believers, just the fact that we are struggling in our faith is sometimes enough to make us feel ashamed. And we draw back from God. If we believe in the God of the impossible, shouldn't we be able to face life with confidence and a smile? Hannah shows us that faithfulness and suffering are not mutually exclusive. Hannah, like Jesus himself, trusted in God and experienced anguish. Saint Hannah is not a saint because she rose above all of her difficulties and breezed through the circumstances that would crush lesser men and women. She is a woman of great faith and great virtue, but she's not a woman living in denial. She is very much in touch with her suffering. And when she is feeling distressed, stressed, depressed, anxious, unhappy, she feels those things. She knows and believes and trusts in the God of the impossible, and she feels the weight of sorrow. If you are a man man or woman or a child seeking to follow God in the midst of sorrowful circumstances and you are struggling, please do not add your own sorrow by confusing suffering with unfaithfulness. Another fear that can hinder hinder prayer is the worry that suffering means God's disapproval or punishment. Hannah's particular sorrows stemmed from her inability to bear a child and from the taunting and shaming that she received because of it. It was a common belief in Hannah's culture that a woman's barrenness was a sign of God's disfavor. And in this case, we know that God had intentionally closed Hannah's womb. If Hannah knew that, would that make prayer harder? Was she fearful that it might signal God's displeasure? Or did it make it easier for her to direct her prayers to the God of the impossible, knowing that since he closed it, he was the right person to ask to open it? If Hannah had scary doubts along these lines, she boldly approached the throne of God despite them. How did she do that? And how might we? We know that sin does lead to suffering and to death, and we know that we will often experience the consequences of sin. And other times, as we learned last week, suffering is permitted as part of a test or trial sent by God to encourage growth. We know these things. That's part of our faith. 
But sometimes Satan will weaponize our faith against us with the haunting but false idea that our suffering will just end if we would just straighten up and fly right. If you would just try harder and learn faster, you'd be out of this mess already. It's clear from Hannah's actions that she knew God too well to fall into this trap. We do sin. Sometimes we are slow to learn. But if you are being tormented with worry that your suffering is your own fault, you need to address these fears by taking them directly to God. God is not a sadist, and he is not interested in playing guessing games. If he is asking you to change your behavior, he will let you know. Priests and prophets and kings in the books of First and Second Samuel all lost power and influence because of their sin, and they suffered in both their family life and their professional life. But in each instance, the Lord explicitly told them exactly what was happening and why. He didn't leave anyone floundering to figure this out for themselves. And our spiritual resources are infinitely greater than theirs. We have the scriptures, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have the blood of Jesus. When we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us, putting our unrighteousness as far away from us as east is from the west. So, if you know that you have violated one of God's commands, repent, confess, receive forgiveness. If you're not sure, trust him and ask him to reveal anything that you know. And the same goes for learning a lesson. Of course, we can all grow through suffering. By all means, pursue wisdom, pursue maturity. But don't get these things, the need to confess sins and the need to pursue maturity, all mixed up with the idea that your suffering will just end if you were a better, holier, more obedient person. This is a lie from Satan who is always trying to use shame to keep us avoiding the one we need. So fears of unworthiness could not keep Hannah from bringing her requests to God of the impossible, and they need not prevent us either. Now, a second threat to coming to the Lord God Almighty that Hannah overcame in her suffering was fretting about the unworthiness of others. One of the things that I admire most about Hannah is that she knew what she wanted And she knew who she wanted it from. And she did not let herself get distracted by people who were making her life harder. The Psalms had not yet been written, but Hannah was already living by the opening words of Psalm 37. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Now, this one I think is kind of tough. I can't remember a prolonged season of suffering in my own life when I wasn't tempted to spend a lot of emotional energy meditating on what the people around me could possibly be doing differently. Even if my pain is no one's fault, I can think creatively of ways that other people could be more sympathetic and more supportive. I wish she'd stop doing that. Why isn't he doing this? When I'm in pain, I tend to spend a lot of time thinking about what I want from other people. And asking God for what I need and want is an act. Now, in Hannah's case, no one in her circle was preventing her from bearing a child. But everyone mentioned in her story was actually adding to her pain in varying degrees. Right? Penina was the main provocation. She was working actively and diligently to make Hannah miserable. Then there's Hannah's husband. Elkanah loved Hannah, and he was working to be supportive, but he was, let's call it, emotionally clumsy. And Hannah's priest, her spiritual leader, blundered in a pretty offensive way at a critical moment. If Hannah was so inclined... She could have spent a lot of time and energy trying to get some respect from Penina, wishing that her husband was more sensitive, or complaining about the ineptitude of the patriarchy in the temple. 
it's a good idea to set boundaries. And even from our gospel reading this morning, we know that we need to confront people um, who have sinned against us. And in fact, Hannah did not shy away from very graciously but forthrightly rightly correcting Eli's mistake. But in her suffering, Hannah notably did not turn to those around her. She turned to God and directed herself toward him. She didn't turn against people. She turned toward the Lord. Hannah knew what she really wanted, and she knew no one around her could give it to her. There's such a strong picture of Hannah standing upright in the midst of all these heavy circumstances and less than helpful people, and she just homes in with laser focus on the Lord, asking for what she needs from the one who has the power to save. So these first two obstacles are fear of our own unworthiness and fretting over the unworthiness of others. The third obstacle is this. Have you ever had something go wrong in your life and moved toward God in prayer, but found that the closer you drew to God, the more painful things seem to become? You're not alone. This happens sometimes. This was the case for Hannah. The closer Hannah moved toward God, the more painful her circumstances became. When it came to drawing near God, some things were working in Hannah's favor. Elkanah, her husband, was faithfully leading the family in all the regular patterns of worship. This was a true blessing and a benefit to Hannah. But there were other factors kind of working against this. The dysfunctions of family life came into full bloom at the holidays. Verse 7 tells us that Penina saved her cruelest taunts and her most pointed provocations against Hannah. She saved those up for the family's annual trip to the temple. What was meant to be a holy and precious time of worship became the occasion of Hannah's acutest suffering. Think about what a loss this was to a woman who loved God as much as Hannah did. The annual pilgrimage to worship the Lord at Shiloh, a highlight of her devotional life, was now associated with shame and with torment. And if that weren't enough, at the moment of Hannah's most intense and vulnerable prayers at the temple, in the presence of the Lord, when she was pouring out her heart to God, the priest speaks up, and misjudges her devotion in a most embarrassing and offensive way, and he rebukes her for a sin that she didn't commit. He rebukes her for drunkenness. Now, if I were Hannah, I might be tempted to disengage from public worship and just say, I'm just going to commune alone with God in my soul. I'm very good at that, and that's what I'm going to do. I might start mentally checking out. I might start finding excuses to stay at home. But Hannah chose to go the other way with her life. As the pressures in her life increased, Hannah leaned into the presence of God harder and more closely and in the most heartfelt ways imaginable. In fact, among the saints of God in history, Hannah was a prayer innovator in this movement toward God. Anna is the first person in scripture to address God as Lord of hosts, commander of armies. And this highlights that beautiful combination of boldness and humility that Hannah brought to her prayers. Her circumstances were messy and complicated, but her prayers were focused and sincere. She knew who God was, the Lord of hosts, commander of multitudes, Ruler of nations, the God who loved her and saw her. And she knew who she was. She was the servant of the Lord. This is a humble title. Anytime a mere mortal approaches the God of hosts, the God of the impossible, there are some serious power dynamics to reckon with. It's wise to keep in mind that a servant makes requests. 
not demand. Three times in verse 11, she identifies herself as God's servant. But can you hear the joy and the pride in Hannah's reference to herself in this way? I am a servant of the Lord of hosts. I, plain, ordinary Hannah, I have a relationship with the Lord of hosts, the God of the universe who commands multitudes. I serve him. I and make myself useful to him. I can approach him anytime, day or night, and I can ask him for anything I want. I know that he hears me because he loves his servants better than he loves himself. I don't know how he will respond. I don't know if he will say yes or no, but he knows all things and he sees all things and he has regard for me. So I will trust him with my whole heart, with my worst pains, and my deepest desires. And everything he gives me, I will return back to him with thanksgiving and make it an offering for the service of his kingdom. This is Hannah's legacy to us. Hannah's second innovation was that of inward prayer. Hannah offers the first recorded example of communing silently with the Lord in her heart. Hannah had a gift for what the Eastern Orthodox Church calls noetic prayer. It unites love, pain, and intensity directed toward God with heart and with mind. Hannah herself describes it here as pouring out her soul before the Lord. Verse 13, Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Now, silent prayer is normative for us. Uh, Most of us probably pray silently more than we pray aloud. But in ancient times, the norm was public set communal prayers spoken aloud. And this is why Eli the priest was thrown off when he saw her lips moving but didn't hear any words. Now, Eli himself is depicted in Scripture as a man who tried to do the right thing. But he is also depicted in Scripture as a man who was less than wholehearted in his duties. This half-heartedness is apparent here in the mistake that he makes about Hannah, but it will come into even sharper focus in the subsequent chapters. And Hannah's devotion is meant to be a foil and a contrast for the state of worship in Israel at that time. Hannah faithfully kept the forms of public worship, She kept showing up for public worship, even though it meant an uptick in her pain. When she suffered indignities from religious leaders who you feel like ought to know better, she responded with both grace and dignity. But to these forms of worship, Hannah brought all the fervency of her heart and her soul and her mind. The outward form of worship and the inner grace of worship were held together in the presence of the Lord. Hannah sets an example for us of bringing the outer practices of worship together in harmony with the inner postures of our hearts. And so it is no coincidence that Hannah's prayers for a child ultimately brought about a sea change in Israel's history and in their relationship with God. Her son Samuel would be the last judge of Israel. And that would bring to a close a particularly long and messy, chaotic season in Israel. And it ushered in a reign of kings from whom our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would eventually be born. Finally, as we round the last corner of our text here, let's look at Hannah's prayer and see how God answered. In the bit of the prayer that we have recorded here, Hannah asks three things of God. In verse 11, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. 
Hannah wanted three things. She wanted the Lord of hosts to see her in her affliction. She wanted the Lord to remember her and not forget her. And she wanted the Lord to act on her behalf by sending her a son. Isn't that what we all need from the God of the impossible in our long sufferings? We want God to see us and to bear witness to our suffering. We want God to remember us and not forget us. And in the language of the Old Testament, when God is said to remember someone, that means he is about to act on their behalf. This is a good prayer, one to remember and to pray. Look upon me, Lord. Remember my suffering and act on my behalf. Let me receive something from you, and I will offer back to you my life consecrated for your purposes. God has an unsurpassed ability to redeem our suffering. In Hannah's case, her suffering served not to signal God's disfavor, but to emphasize God's great favor for her. And not only his favor for her, but for all of Israel. This season of unnatural barrenness was a prelude that signaled to Hannah and to Penina and to the nation and ultimately to the world that God was doing something extraordinary. Her son Samuel would become a judge and prophet after the pattern of Moses. There are tons of similarities between their lives. And like Moses, like John the Baptist, like Jesus himself, the extraordinary circumstances around the birth were a sign of the presence of the God of the impossible working on behalf. And in this way, God not only redeemed Hannah's suffering, he ennobled it. By God's grace, Hannah reached up from earth into heaven. She requested a boy child and she received one. She brought him forth into the world and consecrated him to the Lord's service. God's grace worked through her prayers and through her body to change the course of history. Hannah was merely a humble servant of the Lord of hosts, but she was revealed to be a mighty woman of grace and a type and a pattern of Christ himself who endured the suffering of the cross for the joy that was set before him. Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. For all those who direct their requests and themselves to the Lord God of the impossible, joy will follow suffering like the morning follows the night. Or to put it another way, Joy follows suffering like resurrection follows death. Whether the answer to our prayers comes before death or after death, this reality is sure. And this, the fact that resurrection follows death for those whose hope is in Christ, this is the source of all of our hope and the cause of all of our worship that the Lord God of the impossible has looked on our affliction. He has remembered us and not forgotten. And he has acted on our behalf by giving a son, the one who saves. The longest lifetime here, even were it all to be spent in the dark night of suffering, is nothing but the short prequel to the day of everlasting love in the presence of the Lord, where he wipes away every tear, because our God saves. The God of the impossible, who was and is and is to come, sees you. He has remembered you, and he is acting to save you to the uttermost. Direct your prayers and your whole self to him in confidence of this certain reality. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Spirit. Amen.
We're now going to move to confession of sin. The liturgy and prayer for this is on page 15. And if there's been any way potentially that in your suffering, you've turned away from God, you've let the suffering harden your heart or stop your prayers, that can be one thing to bring to the Lord. Any ways that uh, in our suffering, we've turned to some other God, uh, some other false God to uh, make suffering easier, we can bring that to, to the Lord as well. He's always ready to answer our prayers and he bridges the gap for us. So, dear friends in Christ, here in the presence of Almighty God, let us sit or kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy.